Hey there friends, Dave Pilatus, Can am Missing Project, copyrighted edition for a video page. And this is a video about missing people. Not about news, not about all this stuff, but this is what you call Huck TV. And Huck's with me here, and uh, we've got three very interesting missing person cases. And uh, just to let you see that Huck is actually directing the segment here with us. Huck, you're a good girl, huh? Yeah, thanks for being here, girl. And uh, she will be here as long as she wants to be here, but you never know. But uh, again, a segment about missing people and the issues that surround that for us. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today good girl. is, uh, talked about this a lot before but I think it's important mental health there was a story in the Yahoo News August 30th it kind of hit me hard the title of it was beloved news anchor found dead of apparent suicide at 27 a popular Wisconsin TV news anchor and former college basketball star has been found dead at the age of 27 after apparently taking her own life. Nina Pacholke, a former point guard for the University of South Florida's women's basketball team and morning news anchor at News 9 WAOW, was found dead during a welfare check by police at her home in Wausau on Saturday, according to TMZ. Her sister, Caitlin, told Tampa Bay Times she died of a suicide. Quote, my sister was by far the happiest person I thought I knew, she was quoted saying, adding that Nina was engaged to be married and was loved by everybody. Sometimes you just don't know what people are going through no matter how much you think you know of someone. My sister had access to every resource you can imagine, she was quoted as saying. There's the story. And friends, I tell you this because everyone's fighting their own demons. And even though you may really think somebody is upbeat, happy, having the time of their life, you really don't know. And just like her sister and others, And as people I've told you here in the Flathead Valley who have taken their life, they've always been thought of as some of the happiest, most upbeat people you can think of. Well, Huck's now back in the room. Hold on a sec here. Just gotta make sure that she has the access she needs, okay? Hey, come here, come here. But uh, I saw this and this just further exemplifies how much of an issue mental health is to everybody I know and love. It's a big deal to me. All right. So in doing my research on missing people, I came across a story out of Canada. And this is dated September 30th, 1994. It said, not seeking out remains of crash victims is bizarre. I read this, I couldn't believe it. Let me read it to you. There's nothing with the possible exception of stories headed pol politician found in Love Nest. The media are more pleased to feature on their pages or airwaves than the story this hat that is at its core. What was lost is found. Our letters delivered 35 years late by unfazed Canadian postal carriers, mysterious dis disappearances solved, the wreck of the Titanic found, we loved all such stories. Everyone likes to solve a mystery or how a story turns out. It doesn't matter how old the story might be or when and where it first played out. It matters only that you know the answer to a mystery or can give a story resolution. Thursday's story of the discovery of the wreckage of a TCA airliner that crashed en route to Vancouver from Lethbridge, Canada on April 28, 1947 is one such story. That which was lost, the aircraft and its 15 passengers and crew, has been found. Name me if you can, another Canadian metropolis where an aircraft can crash on land only a few miles from a city and the wreckage remained hidden for almost a half century. 
But then most Canadian cities don't have mountains looming over them. Mountains where skiers and hikers can get lost and die within view of the downtown area. In this case, the aircraft crashed and burned in a gully at 3,600 feet between Mount Seymour and Mount Elsie under heavy first growth cover. The mystery of the disappearance of the TCA flight is now solved, but I submit there is not yet resolution. The investigation team that went to the site found personal possessions, jewelry, and bone fragments, but according to the coroner, there are no plans to do anything more. This is why I'm reading this. Hey, what are you doing? Get over here. Huck, don't think that I'm just reading this and you can get away with, hey, come on. The investigation team that went to the site found personal possessions, but surprisingly, there's no plans by the transportation board to pull the victims. All aboard the aircraft died. Their next of kin were notified of their death and life for nearly 50 years has gone on. There are no plans to look for remains. After all, the crash site is near a creek bed is covered by snow each year, washed by spring rains and deep humus has grown up and around the site in deep brush. And my response to that is, so what? And that is my response to this. I was not aware until today that it is the custom of this country, meaning Canada, to leave the remains of accident victims at the site where they died. I understand there are times when you can't recover a body, as in an ice crevice, or you may wish to leave the remains untouched as a sort of shrine or mass tomb, as in an ancient underwater wreck, but the site of an aircraft crash? I've attended air crash sites and they're a grisly affair. An aircraft crashes with explosive forces and tears the bodies apart. The word commingled sounds like something you'd do at a college party, but it is the term used to describe remains or bones that have been broken and become tangled with others. There are 206 bones in the human body, meaning there were 3,090 bones at the crash site 47 years ago. Some will have washed away in the gully and others, particularly the metatarsals and small bones of the foot, will have deteriorated in the soil and weather of the coastal mountain gully. But some bones, together known as the hip bones, are heavy and tend to endure. Teeth are the longest lasting item. There are 32 teeth in the mouth and each tooth has five surfaces. And as dentists are told in dental college, there are 2.5 billion possible differences between one mouth and another. This makes teeth the second best method of ID after fingerprints. There will not be much in the way of remains at this crash site, but there will be remains. The idea that we're not going to seek out those remains and give them resolution in the form of a burial seems bizarre. Pulitzer Prize winner Susan Sheehan wrote a book called A Missing Plane, in which she details the matter-of-fact efforts of the U.S. Army to identify 22 members of a military craft that crashed four decades earlier in a mountain in New Guinea. A section of the forensic efforts of a physical anthropologist to discover a person's identity from a very small quantity of bone and tooth are instructive. She, you know what she does? She walks around at night and she looks at a sliding glass door and she sees herself and she goes, buzzer. <laughs> you have to tell yourself that it may take weeks or months to piece fragments together and fit loose teeth into the sockets. Even after a man has lost his life and has lain on a far off island with others for 38 years, his bones and his teeth are often unique. So I may be able to make a human contribution. I may be able to keep him from being forever known. I read this article, friends. It's actually blown away. To think that Canada doesn't try to identify and recover the remains of dead body in the middle of the woods of an airline crash. I really thought we were more advanced as a civilization than this, but apparently we are not. On to some letters. Hey Dave, I want to thank you for your hard work. I've been reading your books and watching your films and I'm very struck by them. I'm an avid hiker, camper, kayaker from Rochester, Minnesota. I really appreciate how methodical you are with your research. I've not come across a researcher that is so open and so particular when it comes to not drawing conclusions. When one draws incomplete conclusions without having all the factors, you can never get the whole picture. Ka-ching! There's someone who understands. 
When I sit and hear all these stories, it's so difficult to conjure up what could have happened. All of the obvious scenarios don't hold up. I think of the stories when a hiker's camp is found and the tent has some of the critical gear in it, like food, and hasn't been touched. It's puzzling to me. I've been taught and I practice this up in the SHT in northern Minnesota, and you must have a bear canister. Bears and other animals will go after your food, this is a fact. It's hard for me to believe that this camper got taken out by an animal. At the end of the day, I'm a logical person who always wants to know the truth. I don't know what is happening to these people. The data is the data, and it's bizarre. I appreciate somebody recognizing this and appreciating that I'm not willing to jump to conclusions. That doesn't mean that certain connections can't be made. That doesn't mean I'm saying that all the people may fall into a certain criteria, but I'm also not an idiot to ignore facts that hit me straight in the face. We'll get into more of that later. Next letter. Hey Dave, hope you're well. I'm writing concerning a story from the video you posted on August 28th, the story of the dog Peanut who was operated on in the middle of the night by an unknown entity. Specifically, I'm interested in how that child woke up knowing something happened to Peanut. That happens to me frequently, but the level of information I receive varies. For example, a few years ago, I woke up and stepped outside. As I reached for a cigarette, I paused mid-motion and cocked my head up over my sh right shoulder because I sensed something. Suddenly, I was flooded with memories of my Uncle Fred. Memories of the sound of his voice and the feeling of his presence. It permeated, permeated me in that moment. Then I felt a sense of absolute calm and stillness, pure peace. Why was I thinking of Fred? Why these sensations? I rarely ever saw Fred. He wasn't even in my, he wasn't even my uncle. I just called him that. <clears throat> Around 2 p.m. that day, I received word that he had passed away in his sleep at night. I recanted this story to his wife at the service and she breathed deeply holding back his tears, her tears as she shook her head in a definitive yes. He had in fact died in complete calm and peace. How did I sense this? Was a spirit outside my apartment window in the wee hours that morning watching me play with my toddler, whom he had never met? When I stepped out that morning, was it he that confronted me or was I receiving the signal from a distance? I wonder. Also, a few months ago, a friend I hadn't seen in a very long time suddenly flooded my mind every day, many times a day. I soon learned that she had died of fentanyl. I checked the date of her death. My thoughts of her started that very next day. Yeah, fentanyl. Something I get really, really, really mad about that our government isn't doing squat to stop the importation of fentanyl. The next one is a doozy. About a year and a half ago, I began, I began to grieve, crying all the time. This deep, consuming grief lasted one month. I spent the next month crying too, but it didn't consume me physically as it had the first month. Why was I grieving? It was very confusing. I didn't know why I was grieving. Even more strange, get this. I was thinking about you, Dave. I was thinking I wished you were my father. It was the strangest thing ever. Extremely confusing. But then you released a video informing your village of Ben's death two months prior. My eyes went wide and my jaw dropped. It hung there for several minutes. I was stunned. Was I re receiving emotions empathically? I still don't know how or why that connection happened, but it did. There's no other explanation that makes sense to me. It felt foreign and strange as though I was receiving this information external to me from some source and means I don't understand. It is a pretty cool gift to have, but it makes for strange life experiences. I've impressed many individuals with it, but it is very difficult to live with. I'm glad I finally shared this story with you. I had to wait to share it. I didn't want to be that village turkey claiming to have some sort of psychic connection with you and your son so soon after his passing. I didn't want to cause you any additional grief. But I am a turkey, so here's a story. Make of it what you will. Thank you kindly for reading my letter. You are one of the few heroes, Dave. May God bless. P.S. 
I could fill volumes with my experience. Also, you speak often of wishing people could use their gifts to help others. One disturbing thing I've sensed twice this past year is that a young girl has been molested in one of the two apartment complexes near my home. It is a vivid sense. I don't know which apartment or who it could be. I've never met them before. My gifts are limited. I could try to sharpen them with exercises, but that would basically bring me back to practicing pra paganism. I've staved, I have staved off the ungodly and darkness that infested my life. I won't go back. <coughs> I will remain grateful for the abilities I have and that which I can't control or understand. I must give to God. You know, having those gifts or knowing something and not knowing how to act on it, that'd be scary. Next letter. Sometime around the summer of 81, my brother-in-law Roger and I was working on the Kings Bay Navy Base, nuclear sub-base near St. Mary's, Georgia, building the first 750 housing units on the base. My truck had broken down, so we rode the 35-mile trip, trip a couple of days with a friend. One day he forgot to pick up to take us home, so we started walking. We walked surely. We, we though surely someone would pick us up, but it didn't happen. We quickly made it to the Kingsland and started north of Highway 17 toward Woodbine. We still had hopes someone would pick us up, but about five miles up the road we encountered a thunderstorm. Then darkness quickly fell on us. On that stretch of road, there was nothing until you get almost into Woodbine. It was pitch black, but in the distance we saw what looked like someone with a light in their hand coming towards us. The light, lead this. the light seemed to raise and lower as it walked. After a good while, it finally was close enough for us to get a good look. It was about the size of a softball and was soft white in color. There was no one there, just the ball of light coming towards us. We, we ran backwards, but it kept coming. We were freaking out at this point. Roger had a great plastic lunchbox in his hand, and in the BVB excitement, he threw it at it. It just glanced off the ball of light, and the light just paused for a few seconds and resumed coming towards us. At this point, we're frantic because we had no idea what it was or what it was going to do. We ran back a little further and paused and decided to go to the other side of the road and be as still and quiet as possible. The ball of light passed by us and went about 20 feet towards the west and disappeared in the woods. We ran as fast as we could until we were exhausted. Roger has passed away now. As for me, I hope I never meet up with another one of those lights. It's interesting. Did it mean any harm? What was it? Was it a transport vehicle for something? Hard to say. Take it as a gift that you saw it, though. And that wasn't a blue orb. Help this email finds you well. I've watched your Missing 411 movies and YouTube videos for a while now, and I appreciate everything you do to bring attention to this important issue that so many others overlook. My name is also Dave. I currently live in San Antonio, Texas. I'm prior active duty Air Force and currently with the Air Force Civil Service working to support aircraft maintenance. I was also a civilian police officer for a short time before deciding to join civil service in 2009. Due to my experience around various types of aircraft in the Air Force as well as deployments overseas to include Afghanistan, I'm familiar with almost all types of airframes. When it comes to UFO, UAP, and orbs, that's definitely not of this earth in my personal opinion. Due to my prior law enforcement experience, I am familiar with the investigative process and trying to think of possible explanations of what happened to the missing. After watching a few of your recent videos, you have helped me think of some questions and observations I would like to share. These are in a question form, but these can't be answered by either you or me without more data. Just thinking outside the box. Well, they could be answered, maybe not correctly. Number one, missing body parts in a lot of cases. Not in my cases. 
Why didn't the medical examiner give details on whether the detached parts were precision laser removed or via tears and rips in the flesh to indicate animal claw marks or teeth? I don't know what you're talking about because 99.9% .9 of my cases have nothing like this. Why can't the medical examiner tell the difference between claw and teeth marks? Well, that would probably have to go to an animal expert. Number three, raised GHP levels found in people who turn up to see Slater equals GHP as a growth hormone. Maybe possible connection to ta cattle mutilations. You think so? Cattle are given many growth hormones and maybe the entities, aliens, ETs are taking different kinds of growth hormones for cattle that are concentrated in certain organs. Might explain missing body parts on humans. Again, I don't have missing body parts on humans. It's very, very, very rare. Why do the alleged normal UFO abductees get returned immediately after the experience, while most of the missing 411 do not? Immediately after the experience is relative. If the aliens can freeze time and space, then you're really not gone from here too long. Just a thought. Lastly, what about what's missing or not that there be or not there that should be in the missing 411 that are later found deceased? I know it costs a lot of money and probably doesn't even get done, but what if the coroner tests the body for all the normal chemicals, trace metals that it should have, only to possibly find that they're actually missing? Irrelevant. They would never do it. Too costly. Remember, folks. All of these missing people that are found, nobody thinks anything strange is going on. Nobody. People are found. Over. That's it. Thanks again, Dave, for all you do, and I'm sorry for your loss of your son. He is definitely in a much better place with the Lord watching over you and all in waiting. I hope he's right there. Stay safe yourself. Say hello to Huck for me. She seems like a good girl. She's a great girl. <clears throat> Next letter. Hey, Mr. Politis, hope you're doing well. I just watched your first two documentaries, and I have to say I was blown away by all the different cases. They were very well made and informative. Titles of those two Missing 411 and Missing 411 The Hunted. They were very well made. Also, they really got me thinking, which is the whole point. Focus thinking, and many questions pop into my mind. First, are you notified of disappearances that fit your criteria immediately after the authorities get involved? No, we're never notified by authorities. Or do you only research cases after the individual is found or the search is called off? Sometimes we don't know for years later. I apologize if you've covered these questions in your videos. I'm sure I haven't watched all of them yet. I live in Pennsylvania and have a small family but if someone goes missing within 150 miles of me, I would like to search for them. And you should. You should join a search and rescue team. Every county has their own team. Go to your county sheriff and ask them how to join. Not with the official search and rescue, but I would like to go 12 to 15 miles from the last known location, just on a one in a billion chance that the person isn't in the area that everyone thinks they should be. And not for any kind of fame or reward. I just want to help find someone that's lost and possibly hurt and are scared, especially if it's a little kid. I can't imagine how hard it is for a child to be out there without a parent or at least someone they know. I bought your maps with the names on them, and it looks like there have been many people go missing within a couple hours' drive of me. There's a lot of people missing in Pennsylvania, as I've said before. Missing 411 Eastern U.S., a good portion of the book is Pennsylvania. And there's probably more kids missing in Pennsylvania during the 40s and 50s than any other time in U.S. history in any other location. Figure that one out. I don't know how old each case is, but living in northwest Pennsylvania, it looks like we have our share of disappearances, even if many of them were a long time ago. My one buddy and his brother were fishing one night, and he says he saw a thunderbird. And I believe him just based on his face and his voice when he told me. He was shook up. If this idea seems really messed up to you, just ignore me. A side effect of thinking outside the box is that I hardly ever know the difference between a good idea and a pipe dream. I hope you know that you're helping out so many people. Just listening to the letters you read at the beginning of your videos is proof of that. And I hope you keep making movies and videos and writing books. 
If you're ever in the area or if there's anything I can do for you, don't hesitate. God bless you and your family. I'm humbled. Thank you, sir. The more people I can get out there like you, and I mean everybody out there, search and rescue teams need members right now. And they need healthy people. They can be out in the woods, ground pounding, looking for others. Hey Dave, just a quick note about spontaneous weather events during missing 411 phenomena. I believe that some ancient cultures, such as the Maya, performed human sacrifices so their gods would give them rain and storms because of droughts. That was at least one of the reasons why they would do this. Is it a coincidence when someone goes missing and there's usually an erratic weather event? A quick Google search on why some of these civilizations sacrifices human beings revealed weather was one of the reasons they would sacrifice. My conclusion on this matter is that the devil roams about like a roaring lion seeking out someone to devour. In some cases, the devil may look like that well-dressed man who appreciated the Wolford boy. Sometimes he doesn't, in fact, come as an angel of light to deceive. Other times, maybe it simply looks like missing 411 cases. Anyways, I just wanted to share that thought with you. I hope I'm not wasting your time. Thanks for all your work you have done on the subject. Well, thank you for that, that visual. You gave me a visual. Next letter, Dave. Thanks for doing what you do. I'm just thinking out loud. I'm often wrong, but I feel this could be helpful. When the pupil is ready, the teacher will appear, attributed to Buddha. How does a pupil at the ranch show he is ready to learn? Perhaps by acknowledging that he has received the teacher's message loud and clear, namely by admitting, I am not in control, you are, and that he wishes to proceed to learn accordingly. Example, quote, please help me learn how to ask the right questions in the proper way with the proper attitude. End of quotes. Have they done that at the ranch? No. They walk in, poke the bear, shoot a rocket at the teacher's desk, and then wonder for the thousandth time why the experiment failed. If they walked into Colonel Shepard's classroom at Harvard, they wouldn't have that attitude, would they? This entity stumped even Colonel Shepard. The researchers might try showing the respect and humility the entity, parentheses, in my presumed role, for it has a teacher, deserves request its forgiveness for their previous mistakes, freshman arrogance, and request its guidance and assistance in learning how to communicate with it. Example, behave as one would before an eminent teacher at a university. The you are not in control message may be even more than the entity's response to being poked. Acknowledgement and acceptance of the truth of the message may be the prerequisite for becoming a student at the ranch. I may be wrong, but my guess is this approach is yet to be tested at the ranch. Have the scientists ever introduced themselves to the entity, explain their mission and intentions, express gratitude for the learning opportunity, etc.? Follow the humility of a Native American shaman or medicine man. This approach can't fail any worse than previous experiments can, or can it? Is the entity dangerous? Sure, but so is driving a car, wiring an electric circuit when you don't know how. Any new technology can be dangerous, but it has injured human beings at the ranch. Does that make it evil? Not necessarily. The U.S. military has what it considers acceptable losses. Everybody knows that, yet people still volunteer. Is the military evil? It can be, but in general, not. Attempting to work with the entity may be safer than poking the bear. Therefore, my conclusion is, unless the researchers change their approach, the student remains not ready. Again, this is just one possibility, and I'm not attached to it. Quote, man's greatest leaf in humility. The purpose of learning should be the promotion of the welfare of the people. True learning is that which is conducive to the well-being of the world, not to pride and self-conceit or to tyranny, violence, and pillage. I like it. Next letter. Can't begin to tell you how much being a part of this village and hearing all this letters, news, and happenings as you read, by, read by you mean to me. You're a really neat person, so honest with us. I want to stand and cheer at times. Thank you. Because nobody else in the world has all the wonderfully unadulterated way of presenting a story like you do. Nobody. Anyhow. 
Have you spoken about disappearing objects? I don't remember. Well, I have an interesting story about one. Yes, I have talked about disappearing objects, the golf club and the golf bag, remember? Hope you like it. And if you don't, then oh well. Some are better than others. My husband John's dad was also a John with the middle name of George. He served in World War II and as a result, sunk into a depressed state where he drank a lot, bet on the ponies, and didn't spend much time at home, especially after his kids were born. John had tried through the years to ask about his war experience, but all John knows is that his dad was on Guadalcanal, built an airstrip, and was very bad. John Sr. drank, favorite drink was Biscardi rum and coke. He had a key ring with Bacardi's bat logo on it and his initials on the back. That key ring and some wartime medals were all John had from his dad until the medals were stolen during a burglary. He lost the key ring, which probably fell out of his pocket. With nothing tangible left, John was very sad when he lost that key ring. About eight months later, John and I were in the town of Sandwich, Massachusetts and stopped at the site of an old textile mill. On a flat boulder was a bronze relief map of the factory which we stopped to look at. We're both history buffs. The weird thing is, when was on the side of the map was a the cap from a Bacardi drink, a regular bottle cap with the bat logo in black and orange, just like the key ring. We were taken aback because the whole ride down to the Cape, Sandwich is a town on Cape Cod, Mass., we've been talking about his dad. To find this, well, we interpreted it as a sign. We left the cap where it was and continued our walk. After a couple hours, we headed back to the car, stopping again at the wonderfully detailed map on the boulder. It appeared that the bottle cap was there, except it wasn't. The cap was gone and it was replaced by a key ring. I picked it up and turned it over. There on the back were the initials JGD, his dad's initials. Needless to say, we were shocked. There was no way John's keychain could be there. 90 miles from our home, just no way. But John took it home and still has it. Dave, I swear the story is true, but it's pretty weird. No, no, not pretty weird. That's really weird. Thanks again for all you do. Best wishes to your family, and please give beautiful Hunk a kiss from his auntie. Sincerely. A lot of weird things in life that we just do not understand. In that story, they're talking about his dad, and then suddenly something appears. Well, did that something put their thought in their mind about dad before, the, before that day started? How'd it get there? Very strange. Very strange. All right. Next story deals with a small city called Medicine Hat, Alberta. And the year was 1949. It was just a microscopic little town back then. It involved a little boy named Brent Olmsted, two and a half years old. The date was March 22nd, 1949 at 10 a.m. <laughs> little Brent was wearing a blue snowsuit and he was pulling a wagon and he was playing in his front yard with his German Shepherd. Well, at 10 a.m. the parents realized that Brent was missing and they started looking for him. Well, they didn't really start looking for him until noon when the German Shepherd came back and Brent wasn't with him. That really set off the alarms. And they start searching through town. Well, they found the wagon about four blocks from home on 6th Street. They found that pretty rapidly. Well, some people believe that Brent had walked quite a distance from home up to a place called the Crystal Dairy Plant to see his uncle. But there's no proof he did that. But later on in that day, by the middle of the afternoon, they had 500 searchers in Medicine Hat looking for Brent. So, so where his residence was, that was on 9th Street. And his wagon was found on 6th Street. And then it was quite a distance to the Saskatchewan River for a two and a half year old. 
Now, that's little Brent. So, 500 searchers. The RCMP brought in a dog and they start searching. By the end of the day, on that first day, there were a thousand people in the community. Almost everybody was looking. They searched the creeks surrounding the city. They were all frozen solid. The Saskatchewan River, frozen solid. March 23rd, the RCMP flew a plane over the area. And they thought that they found some small tracks on the north shore of the river near an old power plant. That brought in a lot of questions like, how could the little boy get there? And they thought they saw dog tracks too. Now this area is 140 miles north of Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, where a lot of weird things have happened over the years. Now in Medicine Hat, the ice was never broken. Canines never picked up a scent. His dog came home without him. They did find small human tracks, they said, near the water. But again, none of the ice was broken and his dog came back. Now, the RCMP tried to get Brent's dog to track for him. And they tried to get it out there. And the search went on for five days and they ran out of places to search. The family got distraught and eventually the search was given up. Brent Olmstead was never found. This was in March, it was very cold. Things were frozen solid. What happened to Brent Olmstead? The million dollar question. Considering that his wagon was six blocks, seven blocks from the water, nobody saw a little boy walking down by the water, but yet they found small tracks down by the river. It's quite a conundrum, quite a conundrum. All right, next story. This involves a man, and this, this is going to bring in something. If you have watched Missing 411 The Hunted, pay close attention to this story. It involves a man named David Stevens, 83 years old. Disappeared October 31st, 1964, in a city called Homer Township, Pennsylvania. It's about 10 miles, 10 miles south of Cloudersport. He had about 60 years experience hunting. Well, Stevens left about 7.30 a.m. and he had agreed with his friends to return about 4 p.m. He was carrying a 16-gauge L.C. Smith double-barrel shotgun. Well, when he didn't come back at 4 o'clock, his brother, Ed, and another man named John Barker had already been searching for him, but they went to the city and they got over 100 high school students to be out of school the next several days looking. But they knew David wouldn't travel far because he had a heart condition. On November 1st, the Pennsylvania State Police brought in bloodhounds, didn't pick up a scent. David had bought that hunting camp earlier in the year and had come out with his brother earlier and fished that area and knew it pretty well, his brother said, and the idea that he was lost didn't make sense. David's wife died about 12 years earlier. And on that day in question, October 31st, he had driven up with his brother about two miles up this old logging road adjacent to his property. And then they got out and they walked a half a mile. They were going to hunt squirrels and they were going to sit about 200 yards apart. And his brother stated he last saw David sitting on a stump and they were going to get back together at 4 p.m. Well, at 4 p.m. when he didn't show up, uh, his brother and his friend searched for him for two hours, then went to the uh, police barracks to get help. Seven-day search and rescue that terminated on November 8, 1964. David was never found. So, this is Clowder Sport, Pennsylvania. This is the hunting camp. This is Homer Township. 
This is the New York Pennsylvania border. Friends, do you remember missing 411 The Hunted? And a man named Tom Messick? Do you? Well, if you haven't watched Missing 411 The Hunted, you could watch it. It's on a lot of different venues YouTube, Amazon, etc. When there, I covered a story regarding a man named Tom Messick. Tom was 82 years old, disappeared November 15th, 2015, about 51 years after David Stevens disappeared. And Tom disappeared from Horicon, New York. Now, David disappeared right here, kind of near Cottersport, and Tom disappeared up here in Horicon. I keep telling you guys, water is everything on this. The distance from the Atlantic Ocean to where David disappeared and the distance from the Atlantic Ocean to where Tom disappeared, almost identical. The last place Tom Messick was ever seen, sitting on a rock. His son put him there. The other hunters spaced even distance apart just like David and his friend, and his brother. Almost identical circumstances. When I did the research on this case, I thought about Tom right away. And it's stunning to me, the similarities in these cases. I really don't know what to say about it other than I come up with these. And remember I've told you that we study history for a reason. Identical circumstances. It might be said today when they search for Tom Messick that they had better control, better search techniques, etc. They should have found Tom. They should have found David. Both of them used extensive use of canines. Neither one was ever found. How can that be? These men are in their 80s. They don't walk well. They don't see well. They're not going long places. What happened here? <sighs> it gets frustrating for me. And friends, you know, we can sit here and we can talk about all of these cases. And we can talk about the circumstances. These are human lives. These men have lived a lifetime. Dodged a lot of bullets, per se, in life. And then suddenly, and then suddenly, Suddenly, their life's over. What happens? I, I, I can't explain it. And it frustrates me because I deal with, I deal with this so much that the human trauma of a missing person on a family, when I see it, is huge. I, I just can't explain it to you. It's huge. Next case, Bill Zyher and Burdett Erickson. Bill was 78 years old. Burdett was 77 years old. And they disappeared northwest of Deer River, Minnesota. They left their homes uh, duck hunting for a duck hunting trip, trip October 13th, 1999. They were both from Hibbing, Minnesota. They'd been hunting partners for 30 years. They were best friends. Those kind of trips are the best. When you go with your best friends into the woods, <clears throat> talk about old times, relive all those memories. <clears throat> Both were very safety conscious. 
both were engineers and hunters. Here's a picture of the men. Both of them best buddies. So Erickson had a civil engineering degree from the University of Minnesota and Zyher had a metallurgical degree from the Colorado School of Mines. Both really, really good schools. They'd leased land adjoining a place called Egg Lake and they'd hunted this area dozens of times. They had a custom. And that's, a, that's this is a lot about life. Having a custom and reliving it year after year. <clears throat> What they did is they came, they arrived, they set up their camp, and that first morning before they left, they put a pot roast in a cooker to slow roast it so it was there when they got back. Now they were supposed to be home on the f October 15th. They didn't arrive, family called the sheriff. And the sheriff immediately responded into the area. So I'll show you the, oh, I'm sorry, it's kind of the overview. This is Egg Lake in northern Minnesota. This is the first river. And this is Deer Lake campground. Here's a wider view. This is Deer Egg Lake and this is Bemidji, Minnesota. I actually know this area very well. How do I know it? When Ben was young, he was really good at hockey at a really young age. And there was a couple of San Jose Sharks players that are retired that ran, they ran schools and things and they saw Ben and they said, Dave, you gotta get him out of here during the summer and you need him playing against top players in the world. Cause that's the only way he's gonna get really good, not playing against local kids. And they told me to go to a place called Minnesota Hockey Camp in Brainerd, Minnesota. And they said that that's where all the young players in the world go to train. And oh my God, that just changed everything. Everything for Ben. He came back, he played different. He, uh, he had a different outlook on hockey. Suddenly he's playing against guys that are way better than him at the same age. And he thought, oh man, am I, I gotta catch up. <clears throat> so. I think he was 11 or 12 when he first went, so I was, a, I was a dad that wanted to make sure everything was okay, so I went up there and stayed the week, and I went to the rink every day and watched, and kept my distance, but watched, and made sure everything was good, and then after I got comfortable with things, I'd go north, and I went north because uh, there's a lot of UFO sightings in this area that we're talking about, a lot of Bigfoot sightings as well. And there's a couple Native American reservations there that people put me in contact with other Native Americans up there. I went up and talked to them. Fascinating area. Fascinating area. So anyhow, Bill and Burdett, they don't arrive back. Family calls the sheriff. The sheriff sends a boat out. And I, I have great appreciation for what the sheriff did. They... On that first night that the family called at 11.45, the sheriff found their boat, the Zyher and Erickson boat, overturned. They found life jackets in the water, and the family immediately said, that's not right. They always wore their life jackets in the boat. And then in that area of the boat, they found both men deceased. Here was the issue. The water was five feet deep. These men were tall. They could have walked to shore. So everyone thought, well, maybe they banged their heads or had serious injury. No, there were no serious injuries on the autopsy. So then everyone said, well, maybe they couldn't swim. Remember, they could have walked. Now here's the kicker. The coroner did the autopsy and said that they died of exposure, not drowning. This was October 13th, 1999. Yeah, it started to turn a little bit, but it wasn't freezing cold. 
why not just walk out of the water? Why not help the other get out of the water? The idea that neither one could get out of the water? Friends, that's, that's not realistic. There was a lot of theories about what may have happened. They thought maybe they were running too fast and hit a, a beaver lodge. But there was no proof of that. There wasn't a lot of damage to the boat. So, why, why would the boat be overturned? Why would they be in the boat without their life jackets on? It confounded the police. It confounded the families. Now, one thing I couldn't determine is what the men were wearing when they were found. I think that would have been important. Now, to think that the boat and all both men are right in that same area makes no sense. People don't die at the same time in the same area of exposure. Everyone dies at a different rate. If you and I fall in the water, I don't care who you are, our athleticism, our age, our desire to stay alive is going to push us at a certain rate to get out. So my desire to live may be stronger than yours, but you may be in better shape. But we aren't going to be in that same area. The article said there was land very nearby where they were found. And even the article said they didn't understand why they didn't get their way up onto land. People don't fall in off a boat and die. They didn't have a heart attack. They died of exposure. Exposure is a slow onset in October. It's a fast onset in January, February, and December. This story reminds me of many of the cases that don't make any sense. I don't know what happened to Bill Zyher and Burdett Erickson, but one thing I do know is they died doing what they love. One last thing. Searchers said that they did find their camp, and the pot roast burned to a crisp. So the feeling from everybody was that they had put that on the fire that first day when they went out. And this probably happened sometime soon after they did go out. No witnesses to the event. There were no reports of big weather, tornado, nothing like that. Just an overturned boat, two men in their 70s, died of exposure. I tell you these stories, friends, because they do fit our profile. But also I want you to think. Could this be happening naturally? Is there some outside influence? Is it something because they are hunters? They were duck hunting. Again, no major injuries. David Stevens in Homer Township, PA, never found, last seen sitting on a stump. Brian Olmsted, two and a half years old, Medicine Hat, Alberta, never found. You know, sometimes I go upstairs to bed at night and I'll lay in bed. These stories of these people just kick around in my head. I'm waiting for a day that some entity in the world gives me an epiphany. 
so I really understand what's going on. Because I'm not smart enough to figure it out on my own, I don't think. But I'm going to keep plodding along. I'm going to keep throwing these things in front of you. And I'm going to keep reading your letters. Because together, we may be taking baby steps, but we're moving in the right direction. Thank you for being here. I appreciate each of you. Please do something nice for someone in the community near you. And remember, mental health is an issue in all of our community. Think kindly of people. We're all fighting our own individual battle. Politis out.